Open your Bibles, please, with me tonight to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and while you're doing that, I'm going to read to you Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Genesis 6, verse 4 says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the, unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Last June, we had a bit of a debate in the church uh, as to the meaning of the term sons of God in this passage, where it says the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them. As I said last June, there are two general positions on this topic, and there are, I believe, valid arguments from the Scriptures to be made on both sides. One view, which Brother Jade has dubbed the demigod theory, says that the sons of God in this passage are in fact angelic beings who abducted and made it in a physical union with human women and produced monstrous offspring known as the Nephilim or giants, a crossbred race of demigods as seen also in Greek mythology, 450 foot tall giants as the theory goes or as the alleged book of Enoch actually presents it. For which the flood, the judgment of the flood, came in Noah's day. The other view holds that the sons of God in this passage are actually the once godly line of Seth, who at one time, as we see in chapter 4 of Genesis, uh, both called upon and called themselves by the name of the Lord, but who later intermarried with the ungodly line of Cain, from whom uh, they once had separated and corrupted themselves thereby, going into idolatry, apostasy, and gross sin. And that it was the sin of man rather than the sin of angels, or the commingling of angels and humans together that actually brought the judgment of the flood. As with many difficult topics of Bible doctrine that are debated among good Christians, there are arguments to be made, I believe, on both sides of the issue. And there are also, I believe, good Christians who believe and live by the Scriptures that uh, disagree on this issue. In my view, the position that persistently seems to rely on very questionable, non-biblical sources, like the alleged book of Jasher, which I believe is actually not the original, but it's a fraud actually that was resurrected and published by the Mormons, or the alleged book of Enoch, which is also not the original, and is in fact not a reliable history book either, I do believe that those that rely on the book of Enoch to support the view that the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 are angels do so to their own shame and embarrassment. Uh, That position that relies on those sources is actually by far the weaker, I believe, of the two. And for what I see as very good biblical reasons, I choose to claim higher ground. I I believe it's higher ground and take a position that I believe the sons of God in Genesis 6-4 are not angelic beings, are not angels. I'll come back to that shortly. First, I want to state that the correct and actual meaning of the term sons of God uh, in Genesis 6 has really no effect whatsoever on how I live my life as a Christian or how I serve my Savior. However, how we determine the meaning and the authority for our definition is all important to the Christian life and to our service of the Lord Jesus. But in my view, the meaning of Genesis 6-4 has been turned into a bit of a diversion and is really not worthy, I don't think, of devoting one's study and persistent attention on. I mean, so what if Tom Horn and Steve Quayle are right? Well, I mean, what if there is to be a last day's invasion of the Nephilim or of aliens? What if there is to be a zombie resurrection as Tom Horn and Steve Quayle are now pushing their latest production, The Coming Zombie Apocalypse by Steve Quayle and Tom Horn. What the Bible has to say about the impending war of the undead and what you can do to prepare for it. By the way, does Tom Horn sell zombie repellent on his website? On his survivalmall.com, fearmonger website? This stuff sells books and it sells survival gear, but it does not produce spiritual maturity that Josh was talking about earlier. I do not doubt 
that there is, in fact, a satanic agenda to create transhuman creatures. I have no doubt about that. Uh, but whether I believe that or not has no bearing on my security in Christ. I mean, I've been born again by the power and the Spirit of our God. He is in me as greater than He is in the world. And Jesus has promised not to lose me or forsake me. So I, have, I really don't need to fear these things. There is nothing that the devil can do through genetic manipulation or DNA mapping or transhuman engineering to change that fact. There's nothing he can do. Therefore, the, the meaning of the sons of God in Genesis 6 verse 4, who that in fact is, doesn't really affect my Christian life or how I serve my Savior. It's got nothing to do with what God's called me to do aside from possibly preaching on this subject. And it's certainly, by the way, not worth having a church split over on this subject. However, how I approach the Bible, how I determine what to believe about Genesis chapter 6, and what I hold out to be the authority for what I believe, is an all-important issue that affects all of life and everything that we believe about the Christian faith. And that is something that we as a church must agree upon. And so on that basis and for that reason, I decided to bring this message tonight on this topic. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. It says, Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not, that means argue not, about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. All heresy results from either adding to or subtracting from God's word. Paul says that we are to rightly divide the word of truth. And by the way, that word divide does mean to separate. It means to separate. But Paul's point in 2 Timothy 2.15 is not that we are supposed to cut the Bible up into pieces and parts like C.I. Schofield or like Thomas Jefferson did. Paul's point in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 is that we are to divide, we are to separate God's Word from false teachings, from unprofitable words, and from vain and profane babblings. In verse 14... We are to divide or separate God's Word from unprofitable words that subvert the hearers. In verse 16, we are to divide or to separate God's Word from profane and vain babblings that lead to ungodliness. Paul's point here is that we are to divide or to separate the Word of God from all other words and are to raise it up as our standard, as our sole authority. We are to adhere to God's Word alone is our sole source of spiritual truth. Amen. And are to reject the teachings of mere men that are unprofitable diversions that can subvert the hearers. And that, in my view, includes the books of Jasher, Jubilees, and Enoch, which are not a part of the canon of Scripture, and I believe for a very good reason. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. A verse I've taken to heart and memorized. I love the verse. One of my favorite verses in the Bible says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. You know, we all want to know those secret things, don't we? We want to know those secret things. We're not quite satisfied with those things which are revealed. But by the way, that's why Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. They wanted those secret things they weren't entitled to. There are many doctrines, many issues and doctrines that good Christians disagree about. There are many doctrines upon which there can be no debate and upon which the church must declare a position. Now, there are many fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith that are not up for debate and are clearly a matter of Christian fellowship. But there are also some debatable issues or doctrines that we can't agree to disagree on uh, without separating fellowship. And I think this is one of those issues as far as what we believe, the son, who, who we believe the sons of God to be. But how we get there, we need to agree on. 
That said, while there are debatable doctrines, debatable issues in Scripture, uh, there is no area of Bible doctrine where two opposing views are both correct. Uh, biblical interpretation is never a matter of preference. Second Peter 1 verse 20 says that there is no prophecy or interpretation of the Scripture of any private interpretation. God's truth is not subjective, in other words. It cannot be subjected to private interpretation. God's truth is objective and absolute. There is only one correct interpretation to the exclusion of all errant views to the contrary. And so, the Bible says what it means, and it means what it says, and if we disagree about what it says, then one of us is wrong. So, this issue, I believe, is a somewhat debatable doctrine, although I've come to more of a, a dogmatic position. But I certainly would say this is not an essential doctrine for our church to agree on as far as who the sons of God are. But this is an issue upon which we had better be faithful to God's Word as we approach it. Amen. So what about the book of Jasher? There are two scriptural references to the book of Jasher. Joshua 10, verse 13, and 2 Samuel 1, verse 17 to 18. And I would agree that because the book of Jasher is mentioned twice in the Bible, that the book would have a great deal of credibility if we had it in our possession today. I don't believe we do. In my view, the version is quoted and cited by many today as not credible and is, in fact, a forgery. Therefore, by the way, it's certainly not worthy of citing as an authority in our churches. There are several publications and editions that have been promoted as the genuine book of Jasher. Now, two of those are most popular. The shorter of those was allegedly discovered in the 800s A.D. during travels to the Middle East by a Flaccus Alcuinus of Britain, abbot of Canterbury. Now, the story claims that Alcuinus paid a large sum of gold uh, for permission to translate the Hebrew manuscript into English, uh, which took Alcuin and his assistants 18 months to accomplish. The story goes that back in England then, Alcuinus uh, never made it public but passed it on to a friend and a fellow priest. It then became lost until it was rediscovered in the north of England in 1721 by some unnamed gentleman. Uh, this gentleman kept it private and took great care of the manuscript, giving it to a friend before he died. And so then this unnamed friend gave it to an editor, who also remained unnamed, and published it in Bristol, England, in 1829. It then seemed to disappear into obscurity again until the ancient mystical order of the Rosa Crucis, the one universal Rosicrucian order, published the volume again in 1934. There are no known reputable scholars of the Bible or secular scholars of antiquities who have endorsed this 1829 book of Jasher as genuine. Its main endorsement comes from the Rosicrucians. Outside such esoteric circles, it's generally regarded for good reason as fallacious and fictitious, fraudulent. Another much longer version, the more popular version of the book of Jasher has been, become popular and has had much greater circulation uh, since it first appeared on the scene in New York in 1840. The story of this version claims that the source was an ancient Hebrew text, manuscript, rescued from a Jewish scholar allegedly in AD 70 at the destruction of Jerusalem by a Roman officer named Sidrus. The story says rather than killing the scholar, this, or the, yeah, this Jewish scholar, and destroying the library, which he should have done as a Roman, the Roman officer took the Jewish scholar and the books home to what is today in uh, Seville, Spain. Sometime later, allegedly, the manuscript was sent from Cordova to be printed in Venice in 1625. There's no record of how many uh, copies were printed at that time or how widely they were circulated. But apparently, uh, no Bible scholars or any other scholar was interested in this Hebrew book and no one thought to translate it into English or any other language, um, unlike, by the way, the Bible at that time, until a man named Moses Samuel of Liverpool, England, decided to translate it in the 1800s. So while working on this English translation, Samuel allegedly discovered the Rosicrucians had another version uh, that had been published in 1751 and had been widely exposed by scholars as a fraud. So due to the negative pub publicity of the other uh, version, Moses Samuel was discouraged from publishing his so-called genuine and scholarly version 
Uh, so instead, he sold the translation to Mordecai Noah. 